Hello and welcome everyone to the joint webinar called Quality and Offshore Wind Development in the Gulf of Maine, brought together by the Business Network for Offshore Winds and World Forum Offshore Winds. My name is Ilya Kranaukov and I'm the Development Manager at the World Forum Offshore Winds. It's my great pleasure uh, to welcome our two excellent speakers today. We have uh, Selina Kenham, the Deputy Director of Governor Energy Office at State of Maine, and Michael Bikram, the Offshore Wind Industry Development Director at New Hampshire Business Finance Authority. The session will be moderated by Ben Brown, the Director of Industry Education at the Business Network for Offshore Wind. And before I hand over to Ben, let me tell you a few things uh, about WFO. The organization was found in 2018, and we're a nonprofit entity focused on offshore wind energy only, promoting offshore wind energy worldwide, and our members represent the complete offshore wind value chain. We have an international setup with offices in Hamburg and Singapore. In terms of our activities, it's very straightforward as we focus on three things only. We lobby for offshore wind around the world, we inform about offshore wind via, via our media channels, and we connect the global offshore wind community by doing events. In our days, mostly offline, such uh, or sorry, online, uh, such as uh, the webinar, but hopefully um, physical events soon in the future. We're very happy to have a broad range of global members from around the world, which you can see on this slide. We're delighted to have members from uh, all segments of the value chain from North America, Europe, uh, Asia, and even Australia. And if you're not a member of WFO yet, please make sure to join us and check out our WFO website and also contact Gunnar Hersik, our manager director. And if you have any questions regarding membership, please do not hesitate to reach us. So that's all. That was a very quick introduction. And now I'm handing over to Ben. Ben? Over to you. Great, thanks, Ilya. I will whoa, put it in the presentation mode here. Um, so my name is Ben Brown. I'm the director of industry education for the Business Network for Offshore Wind. Uh, the Business Network for Offshore Wind is is a, a sister organization to WFO, um, and we have a very similar uh, mission and focus. Um, our focus is to develop the U.S. offshore wind industry and its supply chain, uh, and we are a non-for-profit non organization that's membership-based, very much like WFO, uh, and uh, we perform our work uh, by providing information, education, and making introductions between uh, businesses in the offshore wind industry. Um, uh, to date, we've helped make over 9,000 connections, uh, and we do that um, by uh, connecting companies and members with one another. Uh, uh, one primary way we do it is through events, such as the one you're all joining today. Um, and all of that is to, um, um, to achieve a singular focus, and that's to develop the offshore wind industry. Uh, a couple other ways, aside from events, that we help develop the offshore wind industry is we have a couple of uh, products. Uh, uh, one of those is Foundation to Blade. Uh, it's a 20-hour training course on the U.S. offshore wind industry and how to enter into the U.S. market. Uh, we've got Offshore Wind 101, which is a, a, a public um, presentation on the wind offshore wind industry. Um, we have a market dashboard that tracks developments in the U.S. offshore wind industry both in terms of developer milestones, but also contracts that have been executed with companies. Uh, for our members, we have a resource page that includes additional um, reports and research that they can access. And then we've got uh, two uh, public resources. Uh, one of them is a podcast uh, called the Offshore Wind Insider. So if you're curious about developments in the US offshore wind market, then I encourage you to listen to that podcast. Uh, and we also have Supply Chain Connect, uh, which is a database that we use to track the U.S. offshore wind supply chain. Uh, it's free for anyone to register, and if you haven't, if you're interested in being in the U.S. market or are in the U.S. market and you haven't registered for that, then I encourage you to do so. Um, uh, a, a big event that we have upcoming is our 2021 International Offshore Wind Partnering Forum Conference. We call it the IPF. 
Uh, that's going to be in Richmond, Virginia this year from August 24th to the 26th. Um, and that's going to be in person. Uh, so if you haven't registered or if you're interested, then I encourage you to go over to our website and check out, um, check out our IPF conference. Uh, and um, lastly, um, before I turn this over to Selena, um, I'll just make a note that um, so the business network, we track the market, we track the supply chain. Um, we're here today to talk about uh, developments in the Gulf of Maine. Uh, the Gulf of Maine is one floating market in the U.S. marketplace. Uh, there's also floating opportunities on the Atlantic coast, in the Great Lakes, in the Gulf of Mexico, and on the West Coast. Uh, so if you have questions about other floating markets in the U.S., uh, let us know and we're happy to help. Uh, and uh, if you do have questions, here's my contact information. Uh, it's ben at offshorewindus.org. Uh, so once again, if you have questions, send me an email, and that's ben at offshorewindus.org. Uh, and with that, um, I will turn this over uh, to a presentation by Selena, who's going to talk about uh, the activities that the state of Maine uh, are involved in in the Gulf of Maine. Great. Thank you, Ben. Can you see my screen now? Yes. Excellent. So uh, good morning or good afternoon. It's great to be here today. I'll spend a few minutes providing some um, an overview of what is happening in, uh, in the state of Maine regarding floating offshore wind. And to provide a little bit of context, I uh, wanted to start by just uh, pointing out that when the governor took um, office in 2019, she put forward a number of um, legislative actions and bills that uh, put in place ambitious clean energy and climate uh, requirements, um, including a renewable portfolio standard of 80% by 2030 and a, a goal of 100% by um, 2050, as well as um, climate targets that are, are, are ambitious as well. And so that has been the driving force for our, um, our renewable energy program, including offshore wind. And on the left is a map of the Gulf of Maine. You'll see that uh, it's a unique um, uh, body of uh, uh, ocean that we are sharing with New Hampshire and Massachusetts, and as well as Maine. And in the center picture here is the uh, wind resources. And you can realize why we're, we're talking about offshore wind here, given the, the significant resource that we have. In Maine, our, our interest in offshore wind has been um, around for over a decade. We see real opportunity from an economic and uh, a business side, as well as innovation. We also see the, a, a strong connection with our, our heritage industries, um, maritime industries, um, being able to participate in the offshore wind market. And some, some of the um, driving forces for this, obviously, climate change. Maine is the most oil dependent state in the um, nation. Uh, which will require uh, significantly more clean energy on the grid when we're looking at um, uh, advancing beneficial electrification. So that's one motivating factor for our state. In addition to that, we talked briefly about the wind resources that are some of the highest in the country for um, off in the Gulf of Maine. Uh, we also, um, thanks to the work that's being done in Europe and elsewhere worldwide, seeing significant decreases in costs uh, in floating in addition to fixed bottom that will uh, make it more cost, uh, cost competitive in comparison to other uh, renewable resources that the state is, is looking to pursue as well. We also are um, committed to creating a new uh, economic sector in the state. And we're seeing growth, obviously, throughout the U.S. and the world, and we want to uh, take steps proactively to ensure that we have um, the workforce, the ports, the infrastructure, and the companies, and both for Maine-based companies, but also working with global partners to, to build an, a new economic sector here in Maine. And for those uh, who are less familiar, Maine is uh, has an incredibly important uh, fishing industry. And that is, in addition to tour, tourist industry, that is, they're both um, important to the state's economy and the state's culture. And so as we think about advancing offshore wind, we do know and believe that offshore, um, offshore wind and fishing is, um, can coexist. But we want to make sure that we uh, are responsible in our planning and that we uh, take steps to make sure that we have real world experiences to make sure that we minimize any impacts to 
uh, other industries. And also throughout all of our work, are committed to working with communities and stakeholders to learn from one another and find ways to address uh, concerns and questions about uh, opportunities in offshore wind. And so in 2019, the governor announced an uh, offshore wind initiative, which is focused on a number of, of key areas, in, including uh, building on over a decade of analysis, um, innovation, and work that has been done, done in the state so far and creating the, the, this economic opportunity here. And so there are a number of um, different ways that we are doing that. Number one, from a planning standpoint, we're um, launching a, a, a comprehensive economic development roadmap that I'll speak to in a little bit um, in a few minutes. We're also on a taking a phased approach from a project standpoint in order to learn from um, learn from our experiences, and then seeking opportunities to uh, collaborate and work with both pub public and private partners. And we're doing that in a variety of manners, including. Uh, we have a MO, standing MOU with the United Kingdom, working with a National Offshore uh, Wind Consortium, finding other avenues to learn from others uh, and and realize how to bring back best figure out how to bring best practices here to Maine. On the infrastructure side, we are looking at um, a number of ports, including the Sears, Sears port and how it can support the offshore wind industry. And then we are a member of the Gulf of Maine Offshore Wind Task Force, which was created to. Uh, support um, leasing, federal leasing decisions in the Gulf of Maine. On the roadmap front, we are, um, we received federal funding to put together a comprehensive roadmap that will put forward um, specific strategies of how to build this new um, economic sector. This summer, we'll be launching an advisory committee and working groups and working over the next two years to put that plan in place. And in the meantime, continuing to take steps to advance the the industry, but we'll have a, a, a strong plan in place at the end of this effort. In, in March, I think it was March of 2020, the governor uh, identified the port of Searsport as a site uh, for a potential offshore wind hub. And we're excited to, uh, when this uh, re report will be released, we'll outline a number of options for um, of, of how to utilize Searsport to support the offshore wind industry. And we see real opportunity given the um, potential uh, acreage that could be available and the unencumbered um, deep water port that we, we have in Maine. And we have a number of other ports as well that can support um, off the, the offshore wind industry, but Sears Port in particular has some, some real assets. On the project side, as I mentioned, the state has been pursuing a phased approach to development. And that started really in 2013 with a one eighth scale pilot project of a floating uh, uh, platform technology designed by the University of Maine, Maine and put in uh, offshore with a number of other partners. And the University of Maine is, is continuing that, uh, that innovation and, and has plans to have the first uh, floating full scale project in uh, turbine in the, in the water uh, in 2023, which would be the first in the, in the nation in, in the US. And so uh, we're we're excited about that. And then we will we we'll have plans for a, um, a, a, a a the next phase, which is a research array that I'll speak to in a minute. And then um, going forward, we also have we'll have commercial. We anticipate that we'll have commercial um, leasing from the federal government in the Gulf of Maine as well. So this uh, this the first uh, floating offshore wind turbine will be um, in state waters um, off an island called Monhegan Island. And the university is partnering with uh, New England Aquaventus, which is a joint partnership between Diamond Offshore and RWE. And uh, New England Aquaventus is going through the stages of planning and uh, uh, per permitting to get this project um, uh, up and running by 2023. And then I, I included a link there for those who are interested in, uh, there's a vendor registration for companies that, are, that want to participate in this project. And we are um, excited to have this partnership here in the, in the state and excited about the, the project itself. And a little bit about the technology, the University of Maine has designed a uh, concrete uh, 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 floating uh, platform that will uh, can be constructed locally and create uh, local jobs. We uh, see that it's a good opportunity for um, Maine's water depths as well as uh, a, a promising design. And so this will be utilized in the Monhegan project. 
In addition to that, we uh, hope to bring forward the technology um, at in the next project, which is uh, where the state uh, is pursuing a federal uh, lease uh, for a, a research array that is a state-led project. We're partnering with New England Aqua Ventus in that as well. And it is the, pro the proposed project will be uh, 12 turbines or fewer uh, in federal waters, about 20 to 40 miles off main coast, the main coast, and it'll be uh, a lease area around 16 square miles. And so we're working on the early, early phases of designing that project. Um, and we're doing this, one, to get real world experience of floating, um, floating, a floating array in the Gulf of Maine. The one turbine project will, will, will provide a lot of information, both from a technology standpoint and some from a, a ecosystem standpoint. But when you want to really understand how to maximize coexistence with the fishing industry and with the ecosystem, having a multiple turbine array will really provide that additional information that will be helpful. And we are moving forward with a, um, a research plan that will make sure that we have um, uh, some critical questions answered on the front end to help us make sure that future projects in, in the Gulf of Maine uh, are ben benefit from the lessons of this project. And so we've announced this in, in, 20, in November 2020, we're going through a stakeholder process to identify a site. We'll submit a, uh, an application to the federal government, go through permitting, um, and then hope to have the project um, in the water in about five years or so, although it's um, pretty early on to have a specific target date right now. And this, uh, uh, just to show you the area that we we're looking at, we identified a, a general area of interest. And within that, we will cite a, the blue dot on the right is this, the 16 square miles that we will cite within this area here. And as I mentioned, it is a, a research project. It's a, research is a key driver for it. Uh, we will, we're taking an integrated uh, approach to research, looking at both the ecological aspects, the human aspects, whether it be fishing or, or other activity navigation, as well as technology. And uh, we will, this project will be interconnected into the main grid and have a, 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 a terms for 20 years or more for the, for the, the energy from it. So we're um, thrilled to have that project underway as well. And so just to give you a little sense of the types of research that we'll be looking at, um, we're, we're developing a framework now, and then we'll go through a more thorough process to um, ground truth the specific research questions that we want to answer in this specific time frame as we further our work in the development of this project. So that's a quick overview. There's my email and our website. I'm happy to continue the conversation with anyone who's interested. We want to um, definitely find a, a way to work with um, companies and others who have experience uh, globally in trying to make Maine a good place for offshore wind for the today and um, into the future. So thank you. Thank you for that, Selena. And uh, one item I should have mentioned at the start of this uh, is questions are encouraged. Uh, so please uh, ask questions in the chat box. Uh, and then as we go through our presentations, uh, once we get to the end of them, we'll do a Q&A session with Michael and with Selena. Uh, so if you have questions, uh, uh, please drop them in the chat, and then we'll get to that after uh, Michael's presentation. Great. And Michael, over to you. Terrific. All right. Can you see that okay? Uh, do you want to progress one slide? I'm seeing your um, your your notes your notes slide kind of. Okay, hold on one second. Is it coming up? Coming up as a white screen might. Um, Not sure. Um, um, well, let's give it one more try, and then we'll go with what we'll go with what we have. Okay.
and we did this on our check-in and it worked on our check-in so oh there it is see all right let's see third time all right terrific <laughs> perfect uh, well, thank you, Ben. Thank you, Selena. Um, terrific to be here with everybody today. Again, my name is Michael Behrman. I am the Director for Offshore Wind Industry Development for the state of New Hampshire uh, within our Departments of Business Finance Authority and Business and Economic Affairs. Um, New Hampshire has not quite been involved in offshore wind in the pursuit as long as Maine has, um, but we are certainly very excited about the opportunities uh, within this industry and our ability to participate. Um, so I'll be talking a bit about what New Hampshire's resources are. Uh, I'll touch briefly upon where the Boehm process is, um, and then uh, where we see floating wind as, as certainly as a major opportunity, uh, and sort of what are the considerations that we're thinking about right now as we really just start uh, and begin our process of figuring out how New Hampshire can, can be a player within uh, the Gulf of Maine. So uh, for everybody who may not know where New Hampshire is, uh, as Selena noted in her slides, um, the Northeast in the US and uh, we are wedged between Massachusetts and Maine. We do actually have a coastline. It is officially the smallest coastline in the United States. So we take great pride in what we're capable of doing with such a small coastline. Um, and we do have various resources that, that I will touch upon um, within close proximity of where our port facilities um, are currently housed. And um, so we, we, we do look to uh, investigate those opportunities within our port systems, utilizing our academic um, capabilities uh, for various purposes within this market and, uh, and help develop the Gulf of Maine along with, with our regional colleagues, Massachusetts and Maine, um, in a very effective way to be able to capitalize on the generation that is available here. Uh, so a very quick background in terms of how New Hampshire has participated in some significant ways to this point. Uh, back in early 2019, uh, our governor, Governor Sununu, uh, did request uh, to BOEM and the Department of Interior uh, that a main task force, a regional task force, and a governmental task force be created to begin the BOEM review process to identify the leasable area within the Gulf of Maine. Uh, in December of that same year, 2019, we did officially hold at the University of New Hampshire the first meeting of that task force. Uh, it was very well attended. I, I believe that it was one of the highest attended events um, Boehm has had on this issue. Um, so we were, we were very thrilled to be able to see that turnout from all three regional states. Uh, this regional process is a bit different than what Boehm has carried out in the past. Um, so there are, you know, great needs related to coordination amongst the three states um, so that we can effectively and timely um, be able to identify those areas within the Gulf of Maine that are best suited for this development. Uh, in, last year, um, despite COVID, we were able to pass a couple of measures um, important to the state and our investigation of the industry, uh, most notably was the creation of a new commission um, to study offshore wind and port development. Um, that commission uh, has met now since September of last year and is doing uh, an enormous amount of work to understand, uh, again, how we specifically leverage our resources as a state um, and bring them to bear for the industry. Finally, uh, as part of the way that the US, as many of you are probably well aware, uh, has developed its market, New Hampshire did uh, this current legislative session looked to um, put forward a procurement bill that would effectively result in the purchase of um, a minimum of 600 megawatts of specifically offshore wind power uh, with a maximum um, additional 200, also open to other renewable sources, but um, uh, able for offshore wind to participate in that. So a maximum of 800 megawatts uh, to sort of get our foot in the door on the procurement side of this equation. Uh, that bill is currently hung up in a legislative committee um, and will be expected to be worked on again uh, in next year's legislative cycle, um, but we are uh, progressing in that manner toward uh, a goal of putting forward um, a procurement effort. Specifically related to New Hampshire and uh, some of the significant components of our industry here and our economics, um, a, a major piece that we're trying to put forward at the moment that 
I was hoping to have released by this presentation, but uh, we are looking to leverage and utilize New Hampshire businesses to the highest degree we can. And we will be releasing um, a supply chain registry for our businesses uh, in that uh, eventually once we have um, a bit of a mass associated with that, we will put that forward um, to developers, to the public to be able to uh, see as other states have done, what capabilities the state has, uh, what partnerships um, there, there are, uh, with some of our businesses um, so that we can help uh, again facilitate this development. We do have a couple of key assets within the state right along our coastline in, in uh, the city of Portsmouth called the Pease International Trade Port. That is a converted former um, Air Force base that now is a commercial center for the state, a free trade zone and a, a very significant and large commercial airport. Um, as noted, we do have port infrastructure as well that allows for uh, deep water access and some uh, important key interconnection opportunity and onshoring um, for this industry moving forward. Um, another point uh, that, that tends to come up within the US is uh, our business friendly tax structure. Um, certainly this is a bit different than uh, our European counterparts, uh, but we do uh, attempt to structure um, our tax system to be able to benefit uh, and reduce uh, overall tax in, impact uh, to our businesses and, and welcome in businesses that uh, are interested in that. Uh, specifically related to floating wind and, and the way that we're currently looking at it, um, we're very interested and open um, to any and all interested parties that want to participate in that. Uh, we, um, in comparison to Maine, do not have any specific projects that we are currently piloting um, or technologies that we're focused on uh, in the design of, of floating wind. We are very interested, however, in, in assisting in that process and working with um, businesses, developers, uh, and designers to, to investigate other, other opportunities um, in order to help broaden the market further. Um, and, and I would say, you know, following all the amazing work that, uh, that Maine has done in their research efforts and their capabilities. Um, so we're very welcoming of, of anybody who would like to discuss that and the opportunities that might be available. Um, you know, we do think given some of the realities of our infrastructure uh, within the U.S. and specifically within the Northeast uh, and more specifically within New Hampshire, um, that there are some realities of, of our infrastructure that, you know, we would actually like to work with designers on figuring out how to better utilize properties that are available that may have impairments in terms of bridges, um, that may be of a smaller nature on the port side. I think we view this at the moment as an opportunity for innovation within the industry um, to, to develop these components in a slightly different way than they may have been developed in Europe. And I think our perspective is being uh, more creative around the design, around uh, assembly needs and how our resources can fit and work with that. Um, but we're very open again, to, to how we go about that and um, how we explore those different opportunities. So some of the, the, the specific um, considerations in, in a bit more detail, um, you know, we want to emphasize uh, that we, we can bring resources to um, help determine those new avenues. And uh, we're not locked into anything at this point. Um, we do have multiple facilities from a port infrastructure standpoint that we could utilize, some public, some private, um, but conversations and actually some federal, um, but those conversations are ongoing and um, have the capability of being designed around what the needs are. Um, uh, you know, we do want to have, again, that diversity, uh, the flexibility. Uh, we are interested in the transmission side of this and have significant capabilities of being able to move the onshore power um, into different load centers and networks within the Northeast um, and do see that as an advantage to help with this development and market, along with, with uh, certainly interest around storage, um, the, the conversation around hydrogen, uh, certainly in Europe, and, and what we may be able to learn in that process and be able to work with uh, as well. And then as Selena noted, um, the conversation with the fishing community and fishermen uh, of critical importance to New Hampshire as well, 
Um, while we do not have uh, specifically in New Hampshire the type of commercial fishing industry that uh, Maine has, we are right next door and we consider ourselves uh, part of that equation and want to work with um, that industry as well in determining the best uh, best approach to developing floating wind. That's going to be a lot of research, a lot of data gathering. Um, that is a process that uh, our University of New Hampshire um, is it already has a lot of data, but it certainly is in need of creating additional data to create a baseline, if you will, for current conditions within the Gulf of Maine. Um, and certainly in a, a large importance in our mind of engaging the federal government in coordinating those efforts, um, certainly given that they are federal waters and the federal government has uh, extensive resources to be able to help with that conversation and data gathering. Uh, just a few other sort of state-related um, items that do impact this industry. Uh, we are in the process of putting together a state report um, that will help identify um, for public consumption along with legislative um, consumption, the governor uh, and our Public Utilities Commission, what our resources are uh, in more of a formal matter. I'm looking at our carbon footprint as well when it comes to helping deploy this industry on um, uh, more of the regional uh, electric grid, but um, to what degree we'll be able to determine uh, our reduction in, in greenhouse gas as we will. And then also in terms of this offshore wind commission for the state, uh, importantly, there, there has been uh, the creation of new committees that are open to the public as is the commission in the meetings. Um, and these new committees will serve these particular topics, four of them specifically, fishers and environment, port and port development, um, supply chain and workforce, transmission and interconnection. Those are all open to the public and we are actually creating it so that uh, participation um, from particular experts, not on the commission, will be able to join those committees as an official member um, in order to help provide insight into those key uh, specific uh, focus areas. Uh, just real quickly to, to show <clears throat> some of the offerings of some of our state universities, public and private. Uh, the University of New Hampshire does have uh, world-class expertise in terms of ocean mapping, uh, acoustics, um, uh, advanced manufacturing. And so we are um, actively working with the university to uh, help present these different research facilities um, both onshore and uh, out in marine laboratories um, to help develop this industry, uh, to help identify, again, those technologies that we may be able to help move forward from a research standpoint and then actual testing and uh, manufacturing standpoint. Um, but we also do have the other uh, resources in the state in terms of Dartmouth College and their interests within this space, along with our great our community college system um, that is also located in Portsmouth, uh, that can be brought to bear from a workforce standpoint and training um, position. So this just recaps a lot of the uh, items I had just gone over. Um, I'm happy and, and would welcome any conversations of interest into New Hampshire and how we may be able to help serve this industry moving forward and working with our regional colleagues. Um, and I'm excited to hear some of your questions. Uh, so again, please feel free to email me. My email is there at the bottom of the page. Uh, whenever you'd like to, to connect and happy to take questions at this point. Great, uh, thank you. Thank you for that, Michael. Uh, so to the audience, uh, if you have questions, uh, please submit them in the chat uh, and then um, I'll use those to uh, grill Michael and Selena. And uh, Selena, uh, the first question is for you. And um, uh, the question is this. Um, uh, I, I believe this is with respect to the um, New England Aquaventus project. Um, previously, the project struggled with stakeholder relationships, especially with the fishing industry. Uh, how is this relationship now, and what steps are being taken to improve it? That's an excellent question. Um, so, in Maine, we, and as we pursue all of our offshore wind endeavors, think about the fishing industry almost entirely first and foremost about how it will um how to work with the fishing industry what the impacts will be and how to minimize those impacts um on the monhegan project in particular the when the new uh 
fairly new, developers, uh, world-class developers came onto the project. They brought with them a commitment to continue to uh, engage with the fishing industry. And so those conversations are continuing. Um, I think that there are probably people who feel like some of them are going well and others that, that you know, st members of the fishing community who still have concerns with the project. Overall, from a state perspective, one thing that is happening is that the fishing industry writ large is facing a number of challenges uh, that have nothing to do with offshore wind and the changing dynamics of uh, whether it be right whale rules or other um, aspects of their business that are changing. And offshore wind is one piece of a, a challenge that they see coming down the pike too. So I certainly recognize that there are concerns of the industry. We believe that continuing to try to have a transparent process, building relationships where we can, and continuing dialogue throughout all of this will lead to uh, better outcomes. And I think as we're standing up our research array project, part of it will be putting forward a consortium to help drive that research and having a strong voice from the fishing industry about what some of those priority questions are will be fundamental in trying to continue to build that trust and providing real data to help in future um, decision making to make these projects um, impact their industry to the extent that we can, um, that we know we can. And then lastly, from a siting standpoint on the research array, uh, we are working with the fishing industry individuals to ensure that the, the site of this project will, will be an area that is as, um, have minimal, as minimal impact as possible. Uh, I'm going to follow up on that, Selena. Do you could you also mention uh, the moratorium in state waters uh, as some of the outreach you've done with uh, state fishermen? Yeah, so that's a, that's a good point. In our early dialogue uh, at the end of last year on our research array project, one of the pieces that we did hear is strong concern from the fishing industry. Um, about a potential potential project or projects in state waters, which is three miles um, off our coast. And in, in the, for instance, the lobster industry, up to 75% of the landings are from the, that three mile area. So um, the governor announced her intention to put in place a 10 year moratorium on floating offshore, new floating offshore wind projects in those three mile, that three mile area and as a re direct result of those conversations with the fishing industry and um, minimizing impacts. And so we're willing to make adjustments along the way and try to find ways to, to do so. Thank you for that, Selena. Um, and uh, Michael, what's uh, um, what could you say from New Hampshire? What are some what are some actions that New Hampshire's are, New Hampshire is taking uh, to engage with its uh, local uh, stakeholders and communities? Mm -hmm, certainly, uh, we've attempted uh, up and down the stakeholder uh, you know side of the equation to engage in every way we possibly can um, from our business communities and associations that represent a lot of the businesses within the state um, to public forums with municipalities along our coast. Um, you know, again, we we are still in a very um, exploratory phase in terms of where our niche for this industry um, likely lies. You know, we do have within our state a lot of manufacturing capability, um, a lot of companies that um, you know might headquarter down in Boston, but look to make products um, up in New Hampshire. Um, in that if there are ways that we can engage with those uh, businesses coming in to the U.S. or starting um, within the Northeast to make the components necessary, um, you know, we we don't expect that we'll be participating in you know towers or blades, uh, given some of our constrictions within our port infrastructure. But from that side of the equation, on the the you know, manufacturing side to assist the uh, the industry within this region, um, you know, we're we're looking to and excited to explore where we can bring value um, to that supply chain uh, within the Gulf of Maine to, to again, work together with um, Maine and Massachusetts uh, to, to build out a solid regional supply chain and hub um, as well moving forward. Um, I'm going to, because of what you just said, Michael, I'm going to follow up with a question that came in from the audience, uh, which has to, which, um, which touches upon uh, New Hampshire and Maine collaboration. So um, is the state of New Hampshire looking at collaborations with the state of Maine? Uh, 
so that's uh, it goes on to say being able to apply more funding to the research projects underway in Maine could help speed up the process and enhance what they're able to do. Um, as someone who lives and works in Maine and also goes over and visits into New Hampshire, um, um, we can say what we want about cost sharing between Maine and New Hampshire. But um, Michael, if you could go first, and then Selena, if you could comment upon um, collaborat collaborative efforts between New Hampshire and Maine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, happy to. I think it's a great question because, uh, again, this is a bit unique, and you know, we are all Maine is certainly the largest uh, in terms of, of area. But we're all relatively small compared to some of our uh, neighbors to the south and their shorelines and what their their capabilities are. So I think you know first and foremost for the, the collaboration side of it, you know I would note the the task force, uh, the Gulf of Maine task force with BOEM, and our collaboration within that to make sure that uh, as a region that we're moving forward um, and we're all collecting necessary data and talking about how we move BOEM to a point of identifying leasable area. Um, within the Gulf of Maine and, um, you know, and what's needed there. And so the next meetings coming up, which we're hoping uh, will come, you know, maybe this fall, maybe a little bit later. Um, BOEM is obviously very active now, uh, but is having more resources put to the Bureau in order to expedite um, the review of different uh, COPs, uh, but also in terms of what we may be able to do in, in the Gulf of Maine. Certainly there was a big announcement um, last week about moving forward in California in floating wind. And so we're hoping that um, we'll be able to, to have our next um, meeting convene and, and get to those next stages. Uh, in addition to that, you know, I think New Hampshire is very open um, by and large to working with, with Maine um, in what capacity we can, utilizing our resources to, you know, to what Selena had noted, um, understanding that research, uh, what that does for design, how that shifts the the deployment of this technology, um, absolutely willing. We, we are also, you know, very interested in deploying the commercial side of this as well, um, and in you know, in potentially in tandem um, with this research, so that once it gets to a point of construction, uh, we'll be able to leverage the research that Maine is is aggressively working on um, in order to deploy this uh, to a quicker degree. Um, but we're we're very open and excited to working with with Maine. Um, uh, and Massachusetts as our regional partners. Uh, and and Selena, how are we collaborating with our only neighbor state? <laughs> <laughs> well, we are we're we're thrilled to be part of a regional uh, group here, and we can I think we all have pieces that we can assets that we can bring to the table and work together. One way that we've been thinking about it in terms of look at for instance the supply chain. While Maine has it's great is great and in, in, in all its greatness, I'll never uh, <laughs> admit otherwise. There we have to. This is a puzzle piece we're putting together. It doesn't make sense for each of our states to have duplicate efforts across the board. So how can we strategically focus on different aspects of whether it be the supply chain or other parts of planning, so that we can um, work together to achieve results? And I think the state, while um, we are pursuing the state research array. We realize that we want to have the results be meaningful from a regional, national, and global standpoint. And we'll, we're always happy to work with Michael and others to, to do so. Um, I'm going to follow up on that. Uh, we have a question that uh, goes along with um, uh, supply chain. So, Selena, uh, is there an opportunity for companies from outside Maine to register for the supply chain? Uh, and an opportunity to capture work there. Um, could you comment upon that? Yes, yeah, so I put on uh, one of the slides is a link to the New England Aquaventus supply chain database, and that's specific for the one turbine project uh, off Monhegan Island that the, uh, the, the company is uh, accepting um, names of uh, and, and information from companies to put together a supply chain list. Uh, secondly, we are working with the business network to stand up a, a database and we'll, that will be launched soon um, in, in order to have a, a, a broader database. And then the third piece is that whether it be global companies coming into in work in Maine or uh, uh, if you want to move to Maine, we'd be happy to have you. Uh, there are various uh, parts of our economic development um, programs within the state that we um, are happy to go into more details about how we can 
either provide support or uh, share information to make that work and transition as, as uh, smooth as possible. Um, yes, and so uh, the business network is working with the state of Maine, um, and we'll be setting up a supply chain database uh, for the state of Maine. Uh, it will be a, a supply chain connect for the state of Maine. Uh, and for any companies, um, in the meantime, if you want to sign up for Supply Chain Connect, uh, please do so. Uh, and then we'll make sure that the information um, gets ported into the main database. Um, um, Michael, any, um, any updates for uh, supply chain databases, supply chain work, getting involved in the supply chain in the state of New Hampshire that you can share with our audience? Yeah, absolutely. And, and um, again, I apologize. We were expecting by today to have um, our website uh, available with the, the web address on where um, very simple site to, to sign up, provide some, some general information uh, about your business and uh, what area that it would focus in, um, and then eventually build out uh, more of a platform to be able to provide that information to a greater audience. But yeah, we, we are um, actively engaged in that. And I would um, I would check back uh, to the state business economic and affairs website, uh, it's nheconomy.gov. Um, uh, that should be up no later than the next week. Um, but as, uh, as all things are, they tend to take a little bit longer than <laughs> you hope. Uh, but yes, we are actively engaged in trying to accumulate that, that information and then uh, help disseminate it and discuss that moving forward. Okay. And could, um, Michael, could you type that into the chat so that we can yep. that web address so that we can drop that into the chat for the audience? Certainly. Um, I'm gonna I have a couple technology questions. Um, um, uh, this is a, a this technology question is uh, what differences do you expect with mar with marine vessels used to install and service floating wind projects compared to fixed foundation projects? Um, Selena, would you like to go first? Sure. So the biggest difference will be we we will not need the traditional installation vessels that are used in fixed bottom, given that these uh, uh, will be primarily uh, constructed and deployed from uh, the from a from the port. We will need uh, vessels to bring components that are not made in the state. We'll need um, to have anchoring and mooring lines set um, in uh, offshore and tugboats to bring the turbines off offshore as well. And then uh, I think that is the main uh, list of vessels that we need, but the biggest difference will be the installation, lack of the need for the installation vessels, which uh, is a pretty significant um, change compared to the fixed spotting projects. And Michael, are there any um, are there any New Hampshire infrastructure uh, criteria or characteristics that you know you're looking at for potential projects that might change the structure of the supply chain uh, that you can that you can share? Yeah, um, specifically on the the port side of of the equation. Um, we do have uh, right in, in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, a, a small port facility that the state owns um, called Port of New Hampshire. Uh, it is a small port, but um, certainly has capabilities and has welcomed in onshore uh, wind components, and so is familiar with some of the logistics associated with that. Um, you know, maybe move used a bit more selectively, uh, but we do have some private um, uh, landowners that we are actively engaged with to determine. Uh, what resources on those larger sites we will be able to uh, to utilize for this industry. Um, they are very serious conversations and we do expect um, that they will uh, they will bear fruit. Um, at the moment, unfortunately, I can't speak too heavily to um, to what may or may not occur. Um, but the other the other facility that I will note that can possibly have uh, some resource that Maine and New Hampshire share. Uh, <laughs> is the um, uh, the Portsmouth Naval Shipyard. Uh, it is a, a federally owned Navy facility, um, very specialized in its nature, but does have um, uh, some capabilities. It is technically, I will admit, in Maine. Maine does control it. 
even though it is the Portsmouth shipyard, this has been a battle for years and years. Um, but I think you know that could actually serve uh, as a potential assembly location for floating. Um, and there are some conversations associated with that facility. Obviously, that is a very complex situation given the nature of the work that is done there. Um, but but we are interested in in that in utilizing what may be capable at that facility. And so those those are very 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 early conversations that um, will you know will work on. Uh, between our two states and uh, and hopefully maybe be able to to utilize that in the future uh so speaking of things that you might be interested in michael uh i have a question here uh and is new hampshire interested in a small demonstration program in state waters to help show stakeholders the process and benefits of certain technologies to ease concerns for future commercial farms yeah, I think it's a great question. I think you know Maine has has clearly been a leader in that approach so far. I, I think absolutely, um, we're interested in uh, however we can expand our understanding, both for our state uh, in the government sense, the business sense, and then our our public to understand this technology. Um, and certainly, our our the University of New Hampshire has marine um, labs out out in the water. Uh, that are capable of facilitating some of that work. Um, and so we're, we're definitely interested in doing that and helping the overall understanding of this technology for the region and ultimately beyond as something I noted before. Um, so yes, and, and I'd be more than happy to, uh, to talk further uh, about that with whoever or whoever's interested in that or provided that question. Um, but yes, we're, we're happy to, to look into that. Great. Um, and uh, Michael's contact information uh, is was was dropped in the chat so I'd encourage you to follow up with um, with Michael uh, and Selena I have a question here um, will Maine be open to uh, diverse floating technologies going forward uh, and then kind of in parentheses versus only the humane technology uh, is that absolutely. something to comment upon sure absolutely I, I we are our efforts thus far and um, recent efforts have been focused on the university of maine technology because we believe that is is a, a, a promising technology however we know that there are other great technologies out there and willing to work with 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 other um, entities on on those those um, technologies i will note that in the federal process um, there will be a uh, for the future federal leasing there'll be a competitive process where developers will bid and be able to utilize the technology that they see as the the best um, best technology for those projects. And so, while we are um, hope that University of Maine's technology gets off the ground and continues to to show um, support and can be utilized worldwide, we recognize that that's not the only one out there, and we're happy to work with others. Although the research array project in particular, I should note, we are intending to use the University of Maine technology on that one. Um, thank you for that, Selena. Um, I I'm gonna go. I'm gonna. I have a. Um, I'm gonna go with the last question here for the two of you, uh, and it has. To, it it asks. Um, what are examples of the biggest challenges uh, that Maine and New Hampshire are facing in the rollout of floating offshore wind? Um, so, Michael, if you could go. If challenges are opportunities. Uh, so, uh, Michael, if you could go with what you think might be um, uh, one of the biggest challenges to uh, commercial floating offshore wind in the state of New Hampshire. Yeah, certainly. Um, I'll quickly note a few and then uh, because I think they just they're part of the entire industry. Um, you know, I would actually say first and foremost, you know, probably the fishing community within within the Gulf of Maine. Um, you know that that conversation uh, is going to be ongoing hugely important for all the reasons that selena had mentioned before the historic nature of it um, the importance of taking into consideration all the all the different um, factors being applied to that industry and making sure that um, in the development of this clean you know renewable technology um, that we do balance uh, the the impacts um, uh, equitably and, and that we do take that in consideration. But, but you know, beyond that, absolutely, um, you know, we need to start training a workforce, a skilled workforce within this industry. Transmission um, is absolutely a major 
item that uh, I would argue a lot of people are just simply sort of putting to the side at the moment that we really need to get going on that um, discussion sooner rather than later um, because that if we can't get the power in effectively it's going to drive up the price uh, it's going to cause interconnection issues and delays um, from permitting you name it um, but I, you know I would say th those are really the broad ones but that we are aggressively working on trying to discuss and again from a regional standpoint so that we're all on board working together um, to reach a, a solution. Uh, well, you just mentioned some business opportunities in the state of New Hampshire, if someone has some solutions. Um, Selena, um, what is the biggest challenge or some of the challenges that Maine is facing uh, in the rollout of commercial offshore wind? There are three. Number one is obviously the fishing industry and working in, uh, with the fishing industry to uh, find a, a way in common ground on coexistence. And number two is related, and that is the rapid growth of the industry it makes it challenging to have conversations that are based on, this is exactly the size of the turbine, this is exactly what the mooring line will look like. And fishing, uh, fishermen are very used to those types of, of details and willing to have the conversation, but when the, uh, the the technology is ra is is changing so rapidly. It's hard to have those um, detailed conversations at this stage of some of the projects that we're working on. And then I think the third piece is just the sheer size is something that will be a challenge for uh, at, uh, all aspects of of this this project, whether it be the trans transmission or the manufacturing and and deployment that will be new and it's exciting and we're, we're, we're excited to take that on, but it certainly comes with um, some, some challenges as well. Great, and um, uh, one thing that I heard in your talk, Michael, is that there could be a BOEM meeting sometime in the fall or later. Um, so I guess look to, the, look to the fourth quarter for an update from BOEM. Uh, uh, so stay tuned for that. Also stay tuned for uh, a supply chain database coming out for the state of New Hampshire that people can register for. Uh, and um, Selena, what are some items that um, our audience should stay tuned for for the state of Maine? I would say the next major step on the research array, submittal of an application to uh, the federal government for that. Number two is the formal launch of our roadmap effort, which will be public meetings, and anyone is willing to attend. We have um, industry uh, representatives to uh, bring a voice to, from the offshore wind industry about how to shape our, our plans there, and then also on the supply chain database um, launching as well. Great. Um, uh, Ilya, I'm going to bring you back into the fold so that we can wrap up our webinar here um, this morning for our U.S. folks and this afternoon for our European folks. Um, for all of you who have been watching, my name is Ben Brown, Director of Industry Education for the Business Network for Offshore Wind. Um, if you have questions about the offshore wind industry in the U.S., please let me know. My email is ben at offshorewindus.org. Uh, and uh, before I hand it over to Ilya, Michael, thank you very much for joining us. And Selena, thank you very much for joining us. And Ilya. Yeah, over. great. Yeah, great. <laughs> thank you very much for, your, for all of your answers and sharing views today. So that's bring us to the end of the webinar. Unfortunately, it was a great discussion. So thank you very much, Selena, Michael, and Ben for your time today. And thank you everyone for attending this session. Uh, have a great day. To all of you or maybe evening if you are somewhere in Asia and all the best <laughs> bye bye thanks everyone thank you thank you bye all